Welcome to uh, Maurice Jans, our presenter today. Uh, Maurice is a senior researcher and uh, business developer at uh, Erasmus Center for Urban uh, Port and Transport Economics, shortly Erasmus UPT. And as a business expert, he specializes in strategic management and the environment, uh, with interest in how ports and port cities can develop sustainably. Today, he will be telling us about the future of port development and ecosystems perspective. Maurice, please take the floor. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, I'm very uh, glad also to, to share my, uh, my view on, uh, on port development. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, as uh, you, uh, you mentioned um, in the introduction, I work at the Erasmus Center for Urban Port and Transport Economics. So yeah, we, we are uh, actually looking at the, the complex uh, of a port in its uh, ecosystem. And um, I'm actually finishing my PhD. I'm a little bit uh, a late starter, you could say. Uh, but I finished my PhD uh, on this topic, uh, 16th of January, forthcoming. <clears throat> and um, so everything is already, uh, uh, you know, agreed upon. Just have to defend it. Um, so I'd like to uh, to give a short presentation, um, but also uh, uh, if you can uh, keep track of the time. Uh, I can get a little bit excited and keep talking, so please uh, um, uh, be my timekeeper a little bit, and then okay, we yeah, can have the, a, a the, nice, the, uh, a nice we'll discussion. We like to have some time indeed for discussion, yeah. so I will try to limit you to about full forty minutes. Yeah, we have a, uh, we have, uh, uh, I thought twenty five minutes, but uh, yeah. So oh, you can uh, you can take a bit be, more for could, your presentation, but then we could have, be thirty then minutes, we, but uh, uh, then we will have plenty of time. Yeah, we will uh, hopefully we'll have plenty of time. Uh, so, yeah, what is this ecosystems approach? Um, well, um, nowadays, if you walk into a business uh, meeting, uh, like I was yesterday in a big uh, meeting with uh, logistics professionals on uh, corridor development in the Netherlands, uh, so the connection between the port and uh, and inland locations, and they always talk about this ecosystem. But usually uh, only the business ecosystem, eh? so the network of uh, of companies that work together on the in a supply chain or in a uh, on an IT solution or uh, on a big uh, uh, program like uh, joint corridors of road. Eh? So uh, trying to establish a modal shift uh, from road to rail and barge. Uh, that was the meeting actually, and they don't really I, talk about what is now. Uh, the essence of the ecosystem from a port perspective, and and that's also what I took as uh, uh, as my research uh, topic. Um, so, what is at stake in in port development? Um, I'm not sure in, in to what extent uh, the audience here is familiar with uh, uh, what a port developer uh, does on a daily basis. Uh, that port authority, uh, for example, in Rotterdam and Amsterdam, they are corporatized. Uh, companies, you could say, port corporatized authorities. That means that they are put on a distance from political decisions. Uh, so they actually run as a real estate company, and we call that a landlord. Yeah? So in in simple terms, uh, a port authority is a a big shop shopping mall with all different shops, and uh, these shops they flourish when there are uh, sufficient amounts of uh, of shopping, yeah, uh, public uh, the people that that walk into these shops. <clears throat> you can also uh, reflect a little bit the airport, yeah. So where of course the the revenue generator is the uh, number of passengers that are uh, trans transferring uh, through this airport. Well, in a port system, uh, it's cargo, yeah. And to make this port flourish, you need to um, uh, think about uh, having sufficient space. Yeah? So you design and you construct port space, which you can then lease out to companies and who will then do the port operations. Uh, and uh, that's where the cargo comes in as the the, um, the revenue generator. <clears throat> but also it happens that, um, yeah, sometimes these ports areas become obsolete or outdated or too small. Eh? Ship uh, become very large, so they require a different type of scale. Um, and that's why you see uh, some, um, let's say, uh, port handling facilities being abandoned 
and the cargo handling that then moves to to uh, locations with a with a better accessibility for for the bigger ships. Uh, so areas in Rotterdam you could think of as uh, uh, Mare Vierhavens, uh, so uh, near the Marconiplein between Schiedam uh, and uh, Delft and Delfshaven in that corner. Uh, that's typically an area where uh, you see that uh, redevelopment and refurbishment of the previous port buildings is necessary. So that's the third stage of uh, of the development. And uh, also you you find uh, the fourth phase of of development, which is actually that there will not be any port activity at all. So it it is given back to to society. Yeah, and and society, I mean uh, urban development, obviously, because uh, the port city. Uh, usually is is kind of uh, interacting with the port space and and a typical development in this particular um, uh, part of the port development stage is uh, Rijnhaven, where you can. If, I'm not sure if you've been to the Luxor Theater uh, late lately, uh, or to to the World Havendag, the World Port Days, but there you see uh, the the port basin being filled up again with land, and. Um, well, there's some, some land going to be transferred to housing. There are going to be a park and a beach. So very much uh, an urban environment in the previous uh, port basin. So uh, that is the um, the traditional phases of, of port development. And um, uh, of course, um, the um, the SDGs are uh, very much on on topic at this moment in how do you sustainably develop these uh, these port activities and these port areas and and that's also uh, my my field of interest. Eh? So to what extent have port authorities or port development companies interacted with the SDGs and uh, build in um, let's say uh, approaches and um, and planning processes and design process uh, in relation to uh, making sure that nature and biodiversity and the coastal ecosystem can also sustain. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and then we come to the to the next. Um, yeah, uh, what is it? Uh, insight that yeah, if you read uh, the reports that um, yeah, on, on climate change, but also on biodiversity and, and uh, to what extent uh, uh, biodiversity is, um, is, is developing, especially in coastal regions uh, and in an ocean ecosystems. There you can see that in this part of the world, the, the carrying capacity of the ecosystem is stretched to the maximum. Now, what that means is Human activity is putting such a burden on the ecosystem that yeah, you might ask yourself um, uh, how much uh, it can take. Eh? And um, well, we can go uh, into more depth on the uh, on the CO2 emissions, for example, on the uh, on the all kind of waste, eh? uh, toxic uh, toxics in the environment. There are cases all over that uh, especially in in densely populated places like uh, where we are living um, yeah how much can we ask from the ecosystem uh, in adding more human activity uh, and at the same time yeah if you don't create space uh, then new port handling companies will not choose rotterdam for uh, for their future growth so that is that is a dilemma yeah, and um, um, so yeah, we we need to think we need to uh, think about this. Uh, what do we do? Uh, um, so how do we accommodate these kind of ships uh, in the future? Uh, so this was last year. I was standing there uh, uh, in the middle of the port, uh, and this big ship uh, came in. I think at that time it was one of the largest ships in the world. Uh, I'm not sure about the numbers, but it doesn't really matter. These are really big ships sailing into uh, into the port city uh, ecosystem. Of course, uh, generating a tremendous amount of uh, value for uh, for the Dutch economy or for the European economy. But uh, uh, again, this is a dilemma of scale and uh, and sustainability. Uh, um, and uh, if we look back in in time, eh, so we we have solved this puzzle before um, 
uh, we look back into time uh, when the second mass flocker needed to be uh, developed. This was the situation on the left side. Economies of scale were already progressing. I think in 2006, the ships were, well, roughly 10,000 TUs. Yeah, I, I remember the Emma Maersk was uh, 13,000 uh, TU, uh, which is container units on top of a ship. The vessel that I showed before is maybe 20,000, 23,000 uh, TU vessel. So in 10 years time, 15 years time, we have seen a quadrupling, uh, a doubling of uh, of the ship capacity. Um, so the the mass fluctor one was uh, was not big enough uh, in terms of handling capacity. Um, so uh, the port of Rotterdam was faced with, uh, uh, yeah, uh, either losing market share to other ports <coughs> in in Europe, or to uh, yeah to develop space. And then the government, Dutch government, said, yeah, um, but the way we have been developing ports uh, uh, in uh, in the past, yeah, so after the Second World War up until 1990, um, we should not sacrifice nature anymore for this growth, uh, which was the case for the Botlek, for the Europort, also for the Maasvlakte, uh, for the Maasvlakte 1, uh, constructed in 1970, but for the Maasvlakte 2, we need to realize a double objective. That means we create space for growth, and at the same time, we create space for nature. Uh, and that is how Rotterdam acquired its uh, transition space. Uh, Initially, the the mass factor two was built for uh, for container for containerized goods, but if you now look at the clients uh, that are uh, in our port uh, complex, you see a couple of uh, of companies that relate actually to the energy transition and not so much to um, uh, to the container, which was actually the reason why we built the second mass factor. So we have created grow uh, um, transition space for the energy transition. So we have the Holland One, which is the hydrogen electrolyzer, which is currently being constructed here on the southwest part. We have SIF, which is a um, uh, offshore, in, offshore wind installation port, um, where they build these monopiles uh, for the wind parks at sea. We have GATE, which is the uh, LNG terminal, uh, transition fuel, uh, lower uh, CO2 emissions, uh, but not really consist considered sustainable. We have Nesta Oil, which is building a bio uh, refinery plant somewhere in the mass flakte. Um So very much, um, that's quite interesting. Eh? So um, we are using the mass flakte in a different way than we designed it for. So that says something about, uh, um, yeah, um, port planning and the horizon that you, uh, in which ports can be planned in the first place, knowing that the market circumstances will be different in 10 years from now. Uh, and then the, there is a debate on um, growth or actually degrowth. Yeah? And uh, at this moment, you in the, in the background discussions of meetings, at least that I am attending sometimes, um, you hear people say, yeah, maybe we're stretching it too much, too, too much. Yeah? And like I said, uh, not, they don't really feel the, uh, the, the carrying capacity as a constraint, but they see space as a very much a constraint. And that's quite interesting because space relates to the ecosystem. Yeah? If there's no space physically, yeah, then also your, your business, uh, uh, degrees of freedom to, for doing business is, is thereby also limited. Um, and um, uh, this was uh, a presentation. I was not attending this presentation, but someone sent it through to me um, uh, where they talk about the NOVAX, uh, uh, which is the, uh, the new spatial planning um, uh, discussion that's going on, especially with a focus on the half and on the port. There is a spatial puzzle in different ways. Eh? It's uh, a spatial puzzle when it comes to uh, nox uh, nitrogen oxides, uh, infrastructure, uh, the uh, supersized uh, distribution centers, which um, is, is a heavy debate also in the regions. Uh, there is a shortage of housing. <clears throat> and there's also uh, something that we call noise space. Yeah, so the amount of space that uh, all the industrial activities uh, emit 
um, near uh, near um, uh, residential communities, uh, and that all adds to this complexity, uh, this spatial puzzle. Uh, and then uh, we already talked about the transition space. Um, yeah, we cannot demolish the existing infrastructure, the fossil industry infrastructure, if we haven't, uh, uh, let's say, created facilities for the new uh, energy. Uh, so uh, yeah, um, kind of the old versus new infrastructure, which is um, of course also a spatial constraint. Uh, all this adds to this complexity. Um, so where to expand? The North Sea? As a last resort, I would say. Um, now, yeah, of course, uh, we are already doing it with the first mass flux and second mass flux. Um, you see also uh, other initiatives like a, uh, a wind power hub consortium uh, building an energy island uh, in Belgium. You see then on the bottom right, uh, this is already uh, in construction. At least uh, it has gone through the uh, planning process. Uh, we're not talking really about a, a big island. I think this is just eight hectares on top of my head. Um, but um, uh, yes, yeah, so they are building an energy island. Uh, we're talking about uh, wind parks. I think 22 uh, gigawatts of, of wind um, uh, capacity that's being uh, constructed. Uh, solar, uh, maybe a combination of uh, of solar islands. So um, yeah, is this uh, is this the way forward? Yeah. So we are expanding into the North Sea uh, as if it's part of the port. Um, uh, this I picked up from the news uh, last week in the middle. Yeah. So nature organizations are starting to complain about the inadequate protection of the North Sea. Uh, this is from the NRC. This week, you can see that. Um, and um, it's again the environmentalists, and don't get me wrong, I'm not an environmentalist, but I'm just kind of a spectator to what, what we are seeing uh, happening uh, out uh, at the North Sea. Uh, that um, uh, this, this space for growth and space for nature is coming back on the discussion table. Uh, and uh, the environmentalists, they are putting it back on the agenda, which actually kind of makes you think about um, the responsiveness or the, the proactiveness of the poor developing company uh, on, on how to go about with uh, nature compensation. So, um, um, yeah, that brings me to, to, the, to the next. Uh, um, what we are doing at this moment is we are develop I, I mean we're looking at poor development um, without really considering the ecosystem and I, um, I think the ecosystem approach should be at the core of uh, your SDG agenda your implementation agenda uh, that also means that you need to be aware of what what is what capital does this ecosystem provides for society and for the economy and often the invisibility of the ecosystem uh, like like for example i give you an example on the, the 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 capacity of the world oceans for storing co2 uh which is a natural process uh, so 25 percent of our co2 emissions on an annual basis is absorbed by the oceans um but that that also has its limits and uh, you already see that happening with uh, sea, uh, ocean temperatures going up, creating a much more heavy uh, hurricanes and, and uh, rainfall on the land side. So um, you can see that um, we don't really understand these mechanisms of how the, how the ecosystem, the ocean ecosystem, the air uh, and the land ecosystems work uh, like one, one uh, ecosystem which then actually turns uh, against society if we're not uh, really fully aware of how to how to uh, conserve the ecosystem values in that system so um and um that brings me to um what what is the what is then a healthy port city um 
ecosystem where does where does that consist of and and what happens if you don't if you don't uh, fully uh, take care of this uh, this ecosystem uh, values and we have seen that before i just uh, showed you uh, some some very old fashioned uh, pictures of the 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 largest flood we had in the 20th century which is the in the south of holland and zeeland uh, at that time it was also the engineers who said uh, our sea defense is not well protected it's it's degrading and uh, with the next uh, storm um, we could be uh, risking uh, huge floods and casualties and actually in the same winter that this debate was on the table of uh, of the the ministers uh, there was this uh, this uh, tremendous flood and the conclusion actually that what we what we see here is that we neglected our flood defense defense system and uh, i think you can draw the parallels with with other um, elements of the ecosystem eh? so what i'm saying here for example is the ecosystem as a, as it is uh, provides the natural capital yeah, so the, the fact that we have a port in the delta of uh, of Zeeland and South Holland, of course, has to do with the accessibility both on the seaside as well as on the inland side. Yeah, with the ship you can sail all the way up to uh, to Basel or even further to the Danube, uh, Vienna, if you if you want, and even further to the Black Sea. So this creates a vast opportunity uh, for for shipping activities, and uh, that's why you see uh, the companies. Uh, who want to handle port uh, uh, cargo volumes? They are establishing their facilities in uh, in, in this delta region, eh? Rotterdam, Moerdijk, Antwerp, all benefit from the same natural capital. So what we normally see on this ecosystem is only the top layer. We we look outside, we uh, you you visit the Maasvlakte and you see all these cranes and containers and ships. That's all financial capital. Um, but um, uh, on the, underneath, I, I think there is also the human capital. At this moment, the, the biggest challenge for, uh, for companies is how to uh, attract new people, young people, uh, with an aging population in, in various uh, professions in the port. You see that uh, all companies are screaming for, uh, uh, for a new influx of, of uh, talent. So, this this actually is a supporting element of the ecosystem. If you yeah, if you don't work together on on this aspect, um, yeah, there is nobody to uh, um, to man the ships and to to run the trucking companies. Uh, and then there was also uh, what also is important uh, aspect of the ecosystem is the the social capital, the networks, yeah, the the way that people can find each other, can exchange information and, and knowledge with each other without uh, having to incur uh, a lot of uh, transaction costs. Um, and um, uh, so the young maritime networks actually provide also uh, a warm bed for for young people who kind of uh, left the, the universities and then uh, pursue a career and can meet each other and talk with, li uh, with like-minded people. Um, so uh, you see there is a different layers of, of, of this ecosystem uh, that all interact with each other uh, positively, but also negatively. And in the end, of course, you want to create new capital. Huh? You want to innovate. You want to foster in, uh, innovation. Uh, entrepreneurship, but an entrepreneur who comes up with a with his own invention, if he's only working in his uh, garage on this innovation and there is no pickup from the from the larger industries, then this in, this innovation of course will not fly. Uh, and uh, and there are some good examples and bad examples that uh, uh, let's say where these startups and the uh, established companies uh, like Dame Shipyards. Uh, also put a lot of uh, effort into uh, into uh, startup uh, supporting startups, supporting universities, uh, but also be visible for young people to work at Damen. So um, some people, uh, and we call them lead firms, they understand that they are part of this ecosystem and that they they need to invest in uh, in this ecosystem. Uh, it can also be different. Yeah? So uh, today. We also talk about port strikes on the on the east coast of the USA, uh, where you see the unions actually, yeah, um, locking complete ports. So there is also a negative 
uh, effect if you don't nurture the ecosystem uh, and and you don't really cooperate in uh, in fostering these values uh, you may up end up in 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 negative uh, generating a negative effect uh, uh, in the long run. Uh, and that also relates, of course, to pollution and, and emissions. Uh, so this, this healthy ecosystem, I think, uh, uh, thrives by, uh, uh, by investments in all different layers of this ecosystem. So <clears throat> um, we, I've also analyzed uh, how ports interact with the ecosystem. And so I, I looked into what are the ecosystem values, and this is a, a framework uh, that is uh, created by uh, by United Nations. I think the Food and Agriculture Organization came up with that uh, a, a number of uh, ecosystem values, which can then be grouped in different ecosystem services. Uh, so uh, provisioning services, uh, regulating services, uh, cultural services, and, and supporting services. And uh, I looked into two hundred and a database of two hundred and twelve uh, sustainable. Uh, uh, projects which were filed into the World Port Sustainability Program uh, portfolio, and I categorized them in uh, in these ecosystem value categories as well as in the uh, the three layers of the ecosystem: the economy, the society, and the biosphere. Uh, so, to what extent uh, do these projects contribute to the economy, to the society, and to the biosphere? And then you see that quite a number of them, the majority. Uh, of the projects that they are listing as being a sustainable project uh, showcase are um, are still uh, very much focused on the economical benefits, obviously, yeah, because they are in the end a poor development company. Um, uh, they also address uh, the society, but to a much lesser extent, uh, they contribute to the uh, biosphere uh, uh, conditions. Uh, what are then these projects? Well, there is a, a bunch of solutions that they are presenting. Uh, on the economical side, you see a lot of activity going on in monitoring system for energy efficiency, uh, information systems, uh, infrastructure, uh, engineering, some uh, sustainable uh, dredging, for example, uh, sustainable uh, port space, uh, entrepreneurship. Um, all kinds of vision documents on how to go about with uh, sustainability, uh, vessel technology. Uh, when it comes to uh, the society, you see all kinds of outreach programs, uh, education, capacity building um, is, is very high on the agenda uh, and in the uh, biosphere. Some projects also talk about the ecosystem conservation, uh, coastal engineering processes and uh, uh, also, a lot of monitoring uh, on how they actually perform on on uh, the environment, uh, uh, maintaining the environment. So there is a lot of activity on uh, within port development companies on sustainability, uh, but the majority are is still very much on the uh, the eco the eco economy, economical side, with some side effects for society and the biosphere. Um, so that brings me also to a different picture and maybe also a different role for the port authorities. So, uh, and I call that the steward. So instead of being the landlord, uh, the shopping, uh, the shopping mall or the Schiphol airport of this world, they need to be the steward of the ecosystem. And the steward actually is a uh, more, um, uh, taking responsibility for uh, for both society biosphere while also supporting the eco the economical objectives so it's a much more i would say a circular a way of thinking about yeah what are the the raw the resources that you source from the society and from the biosphere uh in every uh in every uh part of your development process yeah? so obviously here for example you're sourcing when you're constructing a port, you're sourcing sand, for example. Uh, one of the things that the environmentalists on the North Sea claim is that the Doha Bank, uh, where we where we uh, retrieve the sand for for building uh, new ports, yeah, it's is actually uh, deteriorating the biodiversity there. So um, it's very much also the 
the uh, uh, their interaction with the ecosystem uh, has both with society and and with the biosphere, where you see that there is a need for for making it visible to what extent uh, this port phase of development is is done sustainably. And the same goes with uh, with the operational phase, uh, where you're also using the resources uh, and you're emitting uh, uh, all kinds of pollutive uh, uh, air pollution or uh, water pollution. Uh, think about uh, sulfur oxides that uh, currently are, are not allowed anymore in, in specific uh, zones around the European continent. Yeah, what do you do with that? Uh, are you going to uh, to wash it out uh, in, in in the sea or are you going to collect it with a shore-based facility? Uh, these kind of operations, uh, there you already see that this interaction with society and biosphere is is affecting the uh, the operations of a poor development company. And so you can also see that uh, in every phase, eh, so how do you reuse uh, old buildings? Uh, how do you refurbish them uh, sustainably? Um, trying to avoid new building, eh, because new building usually uh, costs a lot of CO2. Uh, and also, um, how do you interact and coexist with society? Uh, so to what extent uh, are you worried about uh, uh, the future inflow of, of talent into, into the port, which is beyond what you do as a port development company? Uh, you're starting to think about education. Well, that is very much away from the original model of a port development company. So there you see uh, this. Uh, the interaction of uh, of a poor development company with so uh, society is increasing when there is also a, a, a high need for uh, yeah for resources from the society and like like human capital is of course the most important resource that flows from society into the economical model of a uh, of a poor development company. So I think this is a. Uh, uh, I think I need to look into into the time eh, because we want uh, we want to have some discussion. Um, just uh, a few uh, examples uh, where um, I started off with this dilemma. Uh, so on the one hand, you want to, to have space for growth and space for for nature. Well, there are solutions, and this is a picture from uh, from Ronald Waterman, one of the uh, coastal engineers, a uh, very famous uh, uh, Delft engineer who is now uh, uh, well, very uh, 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 around 80 years old, but he came up with this um, uh, the integrated approach to coastal policy and, and uh, design, where you can see that uh, these, these dilemmas, these double objectives, they can be reconciled into, into new concepts. Uh, if you are uh, ever been to Katwijk, you can see it with your, uh, with your own eyes that uh, this this meervoudige uh, waarde creatie, multiple value creation is possible in the design process. Uh, and there you can also create nature while at the same time create uh, uh, a lot of economic effects with, uh, with a good design. Um, so what different roles? I've, uh, this is maybe also a discussion for, uh, for a topic for the discussion, how to live up to this new role. Um, uh, what does this stewardship require from a port authority that which is different from what they do today? Well, I think uh, the, there is the, this juxtaposing two positions, the landlord and the steward. Um, on the one uh, uh, is about goal alignment. Uh, to what extent are your internal goals also aligned with uh, external societal goals? And uh, you can think about uh, uh, livability, but also client-driven uh, goal alignment, uh, throughput, efficiency, reliability. Uh, and uh, so this is kind of the old model on the left side. Uh, it's rather the old model uh, where port authorities do, of course, uh, uh, take care of uh, of uh, themselves, uh, generating revenue for the for the company, but also for uh, for the shareholders. Uh, obviously, also their own employability, branding, uh, and and uh, having the right people that that can stand and and back their their own mission uh, and run for the company. Uh, but more and more, it, and you see that happening, it's community driven. It's the, the we will versus the I will um, uh, mission that, uh, that becomes important. And 
Uh, I was yesterday talking also with the Port Authority on human capital. Uh, and actually, this is exactly what, what she said. It's really uh, the human capital issue. The shortage of personnel is really felt like a community problem uh, where a lot of companies actually as competitors, they they see the need to work together on, on solving this, uh, this problem. So that, that's quite interesting. Um, so um, you see that it's much more a, uh, a we will versus uh, a, a kind of a, a positive, creating a positive movement, creating kind of coalition of the willing, rather than emphasizing uh, yeah, the, the negative, uh, 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 rather the, the problems and the, and the negatives. So um, yeah, I think I need to this, I'll skip this one. Um, uh, what uh, oh, maybe maybe a little bit back, otherwise we don't understand. So what we what we currently see in the in the uh, in the transition that ports are making, and we talked about uh, what's now the port of the future. Uh, the port of the future, I think, is uh, is combining both the technologically complexity, yeah, so the the need for uh, high end technology like artificial intelligence and autonomous shipping and all these. Uh, digital port uh, concepts, but at the same time addressing the societal complexity. Uh, without these, without these uh, uh, societal dimension, you only get technocratic solutions, which actually work against uh, what society wants from the port. Um, so this um, this also means that you need to kind of. Uh, work on integrative and, and regenerative and collaborative approaches, which are different from the ones that were uh, today. Uh, and then you kind of uh, come to this uh, this complexity. And, and also, when I talk with people from the from the port and the city governments, um, it is, and this is also maybe interesting for the LDE sustainability uh, network and also for Port City Future. What we're doing. We're trying to combine all kinds of uh, research domains. Yeah? So if you look into this picture of the societal complexity on this angle and the technological complexity on this angle, you see that um, it is um, all disciplines really are necessary to um, to make this this transition happen, uh, which means that researchers like ourselves need to work together. Uh, in in networks and communities like we're doing at this moment, uh, but also uh, this is the transdisciplinary approach. We need to be on the table with uh, with port authorities and city authorities to help them with this this complexity and and put different research domains against these complex uh, problems that uh, I sketched in the in the beginning. Uh, where we need to deal with this um, the carrying capacity of of the ecosystem, especially in port cities where where already you know the pressure is very very high on the on the ecosystem. So um, that uh, what I believe I think is also needs different educational values. Yeah? On, on the one hand, we do research. On the other hand, we also teach young people. Uh, to deal with this complexity. Yeah, I'm currently also a coordinator of the, the port management and maritime logistics minor at Erasmus University. Um, and um, teaching complexity is not, not very easy in a classroom, of course. Um, but I think we we need to think about uh, our also our educational role for ourselves. Yeah? So uh, what are the skills that we try to develop with with our youngsters. And uh, I think uh, I, I kind of I'm chewing on these these kind of uh, educational values, but I'm also happy to to hear your um, opinion about it. So that's uh, that's my presentation uh, looking forward to your uh, yeah to your questions and discussion. Yeah, thank you, uh, Maurice. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Yes, please. Um, although maybe some uh, at some point we might want to go back to a slide, but uh, yeah, you're just discussing a very complex system, I would say, and uh, with uh, with many interactions. Um, 
quite hard to, uh, to, 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 to really grasp all the ins and outs, I think, and to set priorities. Um, if, if, if you, well, you, you basically distinguish three different, uh, can I call it access, uh, with uh, biosphere, economy, um, and society. Yeah. And then at some point you had this kind of scoring system um, relating the effect of projects on those various uh, axes. Yeah. Um, can you say something about how you how how you put a particular weight to those different uh, uh, quite, quite quite different quantities? Uh, because it's not that easy to compare society with with, for instance, uh, biosphere. Yeah, they are not. They are not weights. Eh? These are uh, uh, projects that. Uh, oh, this, this is this the number of projects. Yes, yeah, so this number ah, of projects. Okay. So yeah. And yeah. is it then double counting that some projects cover both the economic space and yes. societal well, the biosphere? Um, no, these these are uh, categorized uh, in um, uh, one. Yeah, so these these are there are two hundred and twelve. Projects in the in the database uh, that I, at least at that time it was available. Uh, okay, but so there are no no double counts. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. isn't that somewhat surprising if 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 you make quite clear that you really need to look at the interaction between all those things, that projects take a look at one of those aspects, but actually in none of the cases at at least two, maybe even all yeah, three of those aspects. We did that. Um, we did that on the SDG level. Yeah. So uh, I did it on the SDG level. There, um, you see that uh, they scored them. They labeled the SDGs uh, per project. So there could be uh, hmm. maybe seven different SDGs labeled uh, uh, by themselves. Uh, and actually, what I did is uh, I only labeled the three most important ones. Uh, so indeed, what you're saying, there is an interaction, but I did that more on the um, uh, on the SDG goals and not on the ecosystem values. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, for example, yeah, if uh, if they uh, are improving their uh, what is it uh, their relationship with the indigenous uh, population, which I found also in in Seattle. Uh, and in, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Gladstone in in Australia, where they have a specific project uh, where they involve the uh, indigenous people and the uh, uh, Native Indian, Native Americans, and uh, Aboriginals. Uh, then I classified them as as two uh, educational capacity building projects. I classified them in into educational values and outreach mm, programs. I, I class, yeah. 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 So, yeah of course, it's a bit arbitrary, but uh, um, otherwise, yeah. You. Um, I actually, I only looked at uh, the most important ecosystem value that provides for that project. Yeah. No, I, I I understand. From from my perspective, I would especially be interested in um, how how the different perspectives really interact to come to one yeah. result. Uh, but that's yeah. that's. Need a different perspective. I have done that. I have done that. Yeah, but I left that slide out. Uh, but indeed, eh, for example, if you take uh, onshore power supply, uh, where you plug in your ship uh, uh, when it's in a port and it uses the electricity from the grid, that's where you have, uh, of course, the interaction between uh, 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 the economical perspective, the uh, air pollution that you don't have from running. Uh, huh? Keeping uh, one of the engines running, um, and uh, um, and also the sustainable infrastructure uh, that that ports can provide for ships to uh, to save energy uh, and also to save on pollution. Mm. That uh, there you see the interaction. I, I uh, kind of uh, made it. Um, I have some of these examples uh, where you really show that interaction. Thanks. Susan? Another question? Yeah, and I don't see any hands. Yeah, I, Elise. Elise. Yeah, 
Yeah, I was. I'm, uh, I'm going to try to formulate my question as good as I can. It's, it's, it's uh, quite uh, complex, but yeah, I, I see ports are, as a platform. So so stuff coming in, stuff going out, and yeah. and it's very actually. There's not. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering where ports really have uh, can have an impact because there's little their control. Yeah, it's it's all, also about our consumption as uh, people. So if we still want avocados, bananas, and stuff that come from uh, all around the world, then then ships still are going to come in and and uh, yeah so that ports can control they also can't control if ships are gonna s switch to uh other uh, uh fuels um but oh, i think they do um is is there a way where where the the platform can change like like the way is it's transferred for example in lands because there's also a lot of inland shipping is there ways they could and they could because i i'm not sure i i i saw that in your presentation they could uh, favorize like train connections so we, we talk nowadays a lot about plane train uh is there something similar for ship train to to try to modify what's yeah going out yeah the one of the, going out. yeah one of the you say yeah uh, the question is to what extent uh, can can ports make societal uh, impact because uh, the cargo will be coming anyway yeah uh, um one of the uh, aspects um of a port authority is that they are the regulator. Yeah, so they are playing multiple roles at the same time. Um, they are port developer, that's one, but they also are the regulator. So um, uh, they can, for example, inspect ships. Yeah, they they have a specific uh, uh, tariff system for more sustainable ships. If you're uh, you're coming into a port with a more sustainable ship, uh, less pollutive. Uh, higher energy efficiency, you get discounts from your port use. Uh, mm. That adds up uh, uh, quite quite tremendously for a shipping company, uh, and offsets, of course, the investments that the ship owner will have to make in order to receive these discounts. Uh, that, that's one. That's the very actually the most direct one. The other uh, less less direct one is the um, green corridors. Yeah? So uh, you're talking about. Uh, uh, fuel alternative fuels um, and inland ships. Um, uh, well, there is there is a big consortium at this moment going on that creates the hydrogen infrastructure on the river system uh, in Europe, uh, mm -hmm. which is very much backed up also by governments at the North Rhine Westfalen, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, South Holland. They are working together on a government to government level. The port authorities work together on the port level uh, in order to provide the infrastructure that can be used by the shipping companies, the inland ships. Uh, and if it wasn't for this collaboration uh, and, and uh, the infrastructure development that needs to come either from the port authority or from the national uh, governments, yeah, this, we would be sitting with the same old fossil infrastructure that we currently have. So in this whole transition, you see that sh ports are playing an enabling role in in creating this bunker infrastructure for ships uh, and that is on a on a regional scale yeah? so on an inland side but also on a on a global scale uh, where for example singapore and rotterdam being the the largest bunker ports in the world are now looking into uh, providing uh, a broader mix of fuel types uh, yeah? like methanol and hydrogen not really yet but uh, uh, ammonia that's on the table, uh, uh, biofuels, of course. Uh, and that is because, yeah, these ships, they need to have bunker uh, facilities on either side of the planet. Uh, yeah. yeah, so there is indeed uh, a lot that port can do. Uh, okay. Any other questions? I think we uh, lost a few uh, people on the way. Yes, maybe yeah. uh, maybe a bit the direction where it was going. Hello, Peter Krechting. Okay. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, we just mentioned a little bit about uh, alternative fuels. Uh, yeah. International shipping is doing 3% uh, of the global emission. Is there any clarity of the way ahead, how this uh, is expected uh, to be uh, uh, tackled in 10, 20 years, and what role the port uh, can play in that? Uh, yeah, so two questions. 
um, the the direction, right. uh, the the transition pathway. I need to put it. A uh, I'll put my screen out. Uh, the transition pathway uh, is. Um, yeah, it's looking into a glass ball, eh? Because uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But what what I am looking at uh, often is the DNV and Lloyd's Register and a couple of uh, classification societies. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the the uh, they are companies, but they are a special type of company because they are class. Uh, so in order to to have a ship be certified as a seaworthy ship, it needs to have a certificate from one of the classification societies. Mm -hmm. um, so they actually um, uh, look into the regulatory framework across the whole world, uh, coming from the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, which actually says uh, on the basis of uh, a political process, there is a convention, uh, for example, on the safety of uh, of the ship, but also on uh, on maritime pollution and maritime pollution prevention. Then a specific ship needs to have a certificate. Uh, so. Um, there is this regulatory framework that is currently being tightened, uh, mm -hmm. much more uh, strict. Yeah, so there are very strict uh, uh, regulations now coming into place on the energy efficiency of uh, existing ships, of the design of a ship, uh, the EEDI, as well as on the carbon intensity of the uh, operation of the ship. Um, uh, the carbon intensity index, which is basically an energy label compared to what you have for your house. Uh, and all these measures are uh, uh, pushing the shipping companies um, uh, towards making decisions for alternative types of fuel. Uh, and that is a very strong regulatory push that we are seeing at the moment. And because of that, you see ports responding because one of the conditions is also what to do with on power, uh, shore power uh, uh, imports. Yeah? Uh, only, only that item in the regulation already makes cruise ships, for example, look into, yeah, but uh, how does it work in a port? Uh, this is now the, the the new regulatory standard, but I'm depending on the port authority to provide me with the uh, the energy infrastructure when I come in and I need to plug in my, uh, my cruise ship. Uh, uh, so you see that the port and the ship uh, community, they need each other within this energy transition. Uh, of course, it's also a defensive strategy. If we would, as in Rotterdam would say, yeah, uh, sorry, but we're not going to provide uh, clean energy solutions and alternative uh, bunker infrastructure. Yeah, of course, we are losing out on uh, on this specific uh, market uh, where we are the, the largest bunker port in, in Europe. Uh, so that is not, not an option. You have to uh, kind of, Provide the facilities as a port authority. And there, and there I wonder you mentioned methanol, uh, ammonia. Uh, is there any clarity? What's the. What's uh, on, the on the, on the, on the uh, availability and because uh, it's like uh, the, what comes first, uh, demand and supply. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's very much an economic uh, yeah. question at this moment. Um, um, the the best insight that is currently provided is uh, is also the the alternative fuel insights, which is a website by DNV, which actually shows where is specific uh, uh, fuel available in uh, in the world, where mm -hmm. what's the production capacity, what's the storage capacity, so that I they they open up this. Um, this dashboard um, for shipping companies to to realize, okay, huh, my supply side is secured or not, and on whether when the supply side of their uh, their bank the need for alternative fuels is sufficient, of course, then they will make the the investments in a specific uh, bank of fuel. What you also see is a company like Maersk. Uh, is trying to put its hand on methanol production. So they say, OK, we're not going to be dependent on, on other people creating the bunker infrastructure or, or providing the methanol. No, we're going to invest in methanol production ourselves. So whenever we're investing in a ship, we know that in Northern Europe, we can also uh, fuel up with this kind of technologies. Um, and the um, 
the practical solutions that shipping companies are currently taking is they they prepare themselves for what we call multi-fuel uh, mm. options. Yeah? So uh, most of the ships they can still run on on heavy fuel oil um, or uh, low sulfur fuel oils. Uh, but they are also methanol ready, or they are ammonia ready, or uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So that yeah. that's a that's a practical strategy that they use. So uh, 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 short, Peter, Peter, short I, this. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt you because we are getting okay. quite close to ten o'clock, and uh, okay. uh, I know yeah, that no. there are people. Uh, I am one of them actually who have other meetings yeah. at ten o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I think this shows that well. This also shows the 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 large number of different different angles, different uh, topics that play a role, the perspectives that that you have on all those topics. So the huge complexity of of dealing this, with this. So uh, Maurice, thank you for uh, sharing your inputs uh, and insights yeah. on uh, sustainable port development. Um, yeah, and. Uh, my pleasure. All the others, uh, thank you for your attention, and I uh, hope to see you also next time. Okay. Thank you, Okay.